It is a pleasure to be here this morning. Uh, as Mike pointed out, my name is W. Bruce Lee, and it's a blessing to be with you. Uh, our conference today, the theme is, Why is Integrity Important to Leadership? And I believe a very simple answer to that question is because we're all humans. And as humans, it uh, means we do everything in relationship with other humans. We do things in relationship to our God, and relationships are essential. A local pastor commented to me not too long ago, he says the key element to a healthy relationship is trust. Okay, but I'm going to submit to you today that integrity is the cornerstone of trust. Stephen Covey made a comment some time ago, he wrote this down, the management philosopher, he says the one thing that is common to every individual, organization, family, team, nation, economy, civilization, the one thing uh, which if we remove will destroy the most powerful government, the most thriving economy, the most successful business, the greatest friendship, the one thing that on the other hand if developed and integrated has an unparalleled ability to create prosperity and success and that one thing is trust and trust I'm going to submit is dependent upon our integrity. Now whether we're dealing with government, church, community, family, we're always dealing with humans. And humans tend to disappoint us at times. In my early 20s when I came to Christ, I was lamenting to a local pastor how disappointing humans are. And at that point, uh, I recalled the advice of an older individual who is not a Christian per se, but his comment was simply, in his opinion, humans are no damn good. <laughs> now, I, I'll emphasize he's not a Christian, uh, but his remark was, uh, um, he clarified, he says, some people are pretty nice, but as a species, he was very condemning. Now, I discovered that the fruit of the flesh in Galatians 5 included greed, selfishness, things of this nature, other undesirable qualities. And I learned that through the redeeming work of Christ, we drew upon his strength to reflect the fruits of the Spirit, peace, joy, self-control, and other admirable qualities. So if integrity is the foundation of trust among humans, what is this thing that we call integrity? Now, it doesn't mean we're perfect, because all of us fall very short or that of that, and we have our faults. If you look at a dictionary, a common definition of integrity is the quality of being honest and having strong moral principles, being upright. And as I joke with my students, that means I, I don't spit, I don't chew, and I don't go out with girls that do. <laughs> now, it's hard to argue against being morally upright and honest. But there's a second definition of integrity, if you look, look, look a little bit further into the, uh, the dictionary, and that has to do with the state of being whole and undivided. I think of a building having structural integrity, being built solidly and soundly, able to withstand the stresses placed upon it. The structure fulfills its function. And as two human leaders, we need to be built solidly and soundly and faithfully fulfill our functions, to be consistent and stable. And I think that's a major theme in integrity, being the same in private as you would be in public. There's a psychotherapist back in the uh, early 1900s named uh, Alfred Adler who commented, I love his comedy, that people of genius are admired, people of wealth are envied, people of power are feared, but only people of character, or in my words, integrity, are trusted. Now, we may be blessed with talent, but lack integrity. Maybe we have a reputation, but lack integrity. Perhaps we're very shrewd, but lack integrity or many, many different types of power, but lack integrity. Talent, power, shrewdness, these are all good things, they're not bad, but combining these traits with a lack of integrity is as dangerous as mixing explosive chemicals. Somebody is going to become hurt in the process. Historically, God did not call people of power or shrewdness. God called leaders of faithfulness steadfastness, consistency, soundness, in my terms, integrity. 
Specifically, I believe there are three traits that we as people need to uh, emulate and exhibit. One, we need to be person caring people. And that means I really care about you, I care about the others in the audience, I care about my family, not just, hey, how you doing, good to see you type of stuff. I mean, really genuinely care. Secondly, we need to be person respecting people. And that means a lot of different things. In part, it means letting people be themselves and honoring them for that. We're all built differently. We all have different backgrounds, attitudes, and personal needs. I remember a schoolmate of mine named Bobby Provenzano. God bless Bobby. I remember in high school, well, throughout elementary school too, he had a significant stuttering problem. And at times I might meet Bobby as I walk across the campus quad. And it might take him 10 minutes to deliver a message to me. But I thought, I, as I stood and I listened patiently with this gentleman, I said to myself, I'm not going to dishonor this man by tapping my watch or saying, come on, Bobby. I would suffer being late to class rather than dishonor this young man. By respecting people, we need to allow them to be themselves and realize that even intelligent people have different points of view, make different choices, and that's okay. Now, person caring, person respecting. The third point I really want to delve into is promise keeping. And here's where integrity blends with this whole topic. To be a promise keeping people means simply we keep our promises. That's not too complicated, is it? <laughs> and it means we keep our promises, promises even when it's inconvenient. A few years ago, I was working in Rwanda, and on an impromptu situation, uh, I was invited to go to uh, speak to about 50, 60 graduating college students. And uh, they made special arrangements, transport, took me out to this rural area, and had a delightful, wonderful encounter for a couple of hours with this group of individuals. But then the day was coming to a close, and I said, oh, I've got to go, I have an appointment back in Kigali. I met an individual yesterday, I said I'd meet him at 5 o'clock. And they said, oh no, don't go, no, stay longer, stay longer. The driver protested and the, and the staff sort of protested. And I said, I, I, you know, and they said, this man is of no significance, he's of no importance. But I had to say, no, I, I, I appreciate the desire to be with you longer, but I really need to keep my commitment. Because you see, we talk about being a loving people. Christians are a loving people. And by keeping my appointment with the stranger, I was loving this stranger, even though he may not realize that. And that's okay. As a young man, the concept of love seemed rather sort of vague to me. You know, in English, we have one word for love. And the Greeks, God bless them, have 13 or more words for love. Oh, and I appreciate the precision. You know, I, I love my family. I love my dog, my pet dog. I love photography. I love my favorite food. Uh, and I, I knew there's something different between these types of love, but uh, it was only when I discovered that combining the three traits, caring, respecting, and promise keeping, did I really understand what it meant to love somebody. And by doing that, it revolutionized my world. Now I could take theoretical love and put it in practical uh, application. So let's dive deeply now, if you might into this idea of faithfulness and integrity. Do we realize how easy it is to make a promise? And how difficult it is at times to keep a promise? And do we even realize why we make promises? We make promises to control our future. It is the only way to control our future. And if we out promises, our world gyrates out of control around us. So you may even recall promises made to you that were perhaps not fully fulfilled. But let's, how easy it is to make a promise. Let me give some on a daily basis. You know, your spouse may say, yes, I'll wake you up at five o'clock so you're not late for work. Okay. Uh, we drive by other cars who say they'll stop at red lights and we're depending upon that. We drop our children off at school with the promise of teachers will watch after them safely. We go to work for our employer with the promise of earning wages. We promise our mother that we'll call them after work. We pay all sorts of taxes with the promise of the government 
to spend those monies properly. We plan at work and through government maybe retirement and that the government and, the, and our employer will have those funds for us when we do retire. We ultimately depend upon God's promises for our eternal salvation. As you see, the list of promises can go on and on and on. They're all around us uh, all the time. And promises do not have to be a contract. And they do not have to be, be made with the declaration of, I promise. Our word is our bond, anything we say or do. Matthew 5.33 tells us, do not break your oath, but fulfill the vows you have made. Do not swear by heaven, by earth, by Jerusalem. All you need to simply say is yes or no. Yes or no makes a commitment. Now perhaps it's because promises are so easily made that sometimes we may not take them as seriously as perhaps we should. I tell a gentleman I'll pick him up at 4 o'clock in the corner and I go, well, he'll understand if I get there at 4.30, you know? I said I would do a favor for somebody, but I, I just forgot about it. Uh, I promised to drive safely, but everyone else is driving like a maniac. Uh, I said I would do something, but I just never got around to it. Uh, I was going to review this document, but they realize it's low priority, you know, in my schedule. Um, I wanted to do something, but it's not my favorite thing, so I just procrastinate. Uh, maybe until forever. Uh, the list of reasons and rationales and excuses go on and on. If we take our promises seriously, we are faithful and dependable. If we don't so much, then we're not quite so faithful and dependable. Indeed, promises, again, are the only way to control and plan for our lives for tomorrow, next week, next year, five years, etc. As I tell my business students, under promise, over deliver. As in a Christian, living is an art. So here are a few guidelines I might throw out. Let's focus on making appropriate promises and then keeping them. Wisdom is required in that process. And James 1.5 tells us if you lack wisdom, God will give it to us generously. In turn, that when we are, we should only make promises that we can, are reasonably assured that we can keep. Which means, in turn, we need to be thoughtful, intentional, and deliberate in our living, rather than just uh, bumbling around. Don't rush into a promise. Be careful. Be careful with our words. If I say to someone, hey, I might give you a thousand dollars, they may hear, he will give me a thousand dollars. So I better say, I might give you a thousand dollars, but I gotta check my family first. I'm looking at my bank account and I'm not sure, but you know, okay, make it very clear up front as to what's going on. And if we're making a promise with good intent, may I suggest we actually might want to be serious enough to write it down? You know? So we don't forget. As I again tell my students, if you can remember everything you have to do, you probably do not have enough to do. So I have a long list of to-dos, and they back up for months, literally. And the things I want to do, or need to do, or I've committed to do, i.e. I promise to do, and often those promises have deadlines, and I endeavor to finish those promises first before other things. Even this presentation today was a commitment from many months ago, nine months ago probably. And it took many hours you know, over, the, over the months to pull everything together and fulfill my timeline. But I find spare time like we always find spare change. Rarely do I find a $50 bill laying around. You know, I find a nickel and a dime here, and you got to work, and it takes effort to piece it all together. And though we all have overwhelming demands at times, I think it's the honorable thing to do to fulfill our pledges. You know, sometimes we receive special recognitions and rewards or awards. And, and recently, much to my surprise, just a few weeks ago, uh, I was named the Outstanding Citizen Advocate of the Year for all of California. Wow. Totally, totally blown me away. I had no idea. Totally humming, uh, humbling. 
and, and it brought me a, a handsome cash reward also. Very nice, very, very nice. But I only mention this for this point. Much more heart touching, much more meaningful to me was a dear woman I know that in the past three weeks came to me and said, you know, the major difference I see between you and other people is that you do what you say you're going to do. And that is so humbling and such a blessing. It truly, truly touched my soul. Yes. Now, some people have no intention of keeping their promises. I viewed a legal case, legal case recently. A guy borrowed $5,000 from a, quote, friend. He was going to invest the money. He, didn't, he, he did not invest the money. He, he took a trip instead to the Caribbean or someplace. And uh, when he called on it, the fellow uh, ultimately uh, confessed and said, yeah, that's what I did, et cetera, et cetera. But his justification was, my friend had not been very nice to me two weeks ago. And so that was, his, you know, oh, wow, talk about stupid. You know, <laughs> talk about, you know, uh, people harming people intentionally. Now, since people can be greedy and dishonest, we at times use legal contracts or other administrative guarantees of, uh, of our performance. But even now, people have grown comfortable with breaking contracts with impunity. Yeah. It's a game of my lawyer can beat up your lawyer. Mm -hmm. uh, who's more clever than the other? Uh, contracts are no substitute for integrity and promise keeping. All contracts have edges and people learn to work around the edges. Uh, and contracts, this process, train us not to trust others, which is a real drain upon our society, our economy. And furthermore, legal contracts do not train us to be people of integrity. They are merely a band-aid, a solution on a society filled with corruption. Now, while there are intentional liars and thieves, we also have another category of the casual promise breakers. And I just want to show a couple of illustrations here. Those that uh, said they might do something, but I know a person who borrowed some tools from me. Came back, two tools are missing. He said, oh my goodness, what happened to them? I said, I don't know, you had them, not me. And he said, well, I'll replace those tools. I said, great, but he never did. Perhaps he never got around to it. Or I loaned an acquaintance some years ago. I was at a community event, and he saw me and said, oh, I want to like to buy this, but I have no cash. Will you loan me $20? I said, sure. Now, hopefully, if I had been in the reverse, I would have gone home, written a check, and sent it back right away. Uh, he did not. And over the years, I've seen him a few times, and it's not that $20 is all that important, but it's the principle. I would politely say, hey, do you remember that $20 I loaned to you? Oh, he's never repaid me, even being reminded. If I had been reminded, I don't know, hopefully I would have got in horror. Oh my gosh, <laughs> forgive me, here's 30 bucks, you know. But let, let's, as, as that may be, I think our reputations and character are worth far more than $20. And as a final illustration, I know a wonderful, wonderful person who I adore, who has many times told me that he would do this or that for me. However, the pledges frequently were left unfulfilled. And so I had learned, really, even though he might give those pledges with the best of intent, not to depend upon those pledges. He was not being dishonorable, but I learned not to depend upon those pledges. Some of us are at ease at breaking our promises or our word with little consequence. That's an unfortunate problem of the world. Romans 12.2 tells us, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. And if we ever find ourselves in a situation where we're unable to fulfill a promise, let's be honest, straightforward about that in a loving way. We all make errors. Let's take responsibility for our error. If I break a promise, I should be clear to everyone as to why. And if I certainly cannot keep our promise at all, I need to explain the situation. Ask for forgiveness and release, perhaps. Or how can I make amends to fill it in some other way? Being a loving community of people simply means, again, that we're promise-keeping, person-respecting, and person-caring. Uh, and promise-keeping builds integrity, which restores trust.
Christian love will push us to our limits. As I heard once said, earthen vessels or pots, clay pots, put closely together eventually become crack pots. <laughs> so we're all going to, our faith, we're all going to be a little bit of a crack pot at one point or another. We all fall short, but we can strive. Keeping our promise is our ability to bless others. Intentionality, steadfastness, being true despite the circumstances, hanging in there, exercising self-control, huge quantities of wisdom, all part of the Christian living, the art thereof. And the personal fruit of keeping our word, our promises, is credibility and personal peace. We must remember that tomorrow does not have to be the same as yesterday. And while we cannot take responsibility for the whole world, we can take responsibility for ourselves, and in doing so, maybe impact the whole world. An unknown monk around 1100 AD uh, had this comment. He said, when I was a young man, I wanted to change the world. I found it difficult to change the world, so I tried to change my nation. When I found I couldn't change the nation, I began to focus on my town. I couldn't change the town, and as an older man, I tried to change my family. Now, as an old man, I realized that the only thing I can change is myself. And suddenly I realized that if I had long ago done that, I could have had an impact on my family. And we could have had an impact on our town. And our town could have an impact on our nation. And indeed, I could have impacted our whole world. So let's change the world together by God's grace. And I thank you for your time. I thank you for your love and your attention. And as I generally conclude my comments, if I have shared anything today that makes sense, let's give the credit to Jesus Christ. And if anything sounds a little off, I take the personal responsibility. God bless you. Thank you all very much. Love to you. Very good.